So we've talked about this already, but we're just going to review real quick. Macroevolution, those are large scale changes. When I say large scale changes, you should understand that they happen over a long period of time. And what we're talking about is massive amounts of speciation, lots of new species um, uh, coming about that, that weren't previously there. Okay, so large scale changes. So massive speciation occurring over a large time period. Okay. And uh, there's two different um, sort of theories as to the way that this happens. Uh, the first one's called gradualism, and I know we've already um, talked about it, but bear with me because I want to talk about how it relates to, to what we've been discussing. Gradualism is the, ty the type that makes sense to us um, based on, on the last couple days of notes. So, for instance, like yesterday, we talked about the fact that like uh, new mutations would just build up in a gene pool. Right, so over time, a mutation happens, and then like another one happens, and another one happens, and another one happens, and um, slowly those species would get more and more different from one another. Okay, that's the idea behind gradualism: is that small changes happen over a large period of time. and will eventually build up to cause species to look very different from one another. Now this makes sense. It's it seems like the logical thing when we when we learn about mutations and how mutations happen. But the interesting thing here is this is not supported by the fossil record. When you go back and you look at the fossils, uh, you don't see gradualism. What you see are periods where instead of having um, small changes happen, you know, gradually, you see periods where just, there's no change at all, right? Where species stay the same for a really long period of time, and then all of a sudden. Boom, there's this massive shift and everything gets crazy, right? And there's lots of new species that pop up. And I say like all of a sudden, but it's not really all of a sudden. It's like all of a sudden on a geologic time scale, which could be like 100,000 years still. But that, still, that's like really fast compared to billions of years that the Earth has been around, okay? This concept is called punctuated equilibrium. And punctuated equilibrium uh, is the concept that equilibrium means um, no change, right? So the concept that there's, a no, there's no change in species for a really long period of time. And then every once in a while, there's an interrupted point of punctuation in that um, equilibrium where everything just goes crazy and it starts changing really rapidly. So long periods of no change are interrupted. by short periods of rapid change. Now, the question for this is, like, why? Why would this happen? What's up? That's yeah, yeah. Why, why does something like this happen? This doesn't make any sense. This is, this is just weird and, and makes no sense. So how could this even be possible? Well. There's two driving forces behind punctuated equilibrium. In fact, we understand these forces fairly well. Okay? Number one, mass extinctions. Okay? The definition of a mass extinction is when 50% of the species on Earth go extinct. Right? So at least 50% of the species on Earth Go extinct. 
Why does this happen? Well, there's not just one reason why mass extinctions happen. There's been a lot of mass extinctions, as many as 11, uh, depending on how you count them. Um, but they all happen for different reasons. So sometimes there's like uh, an asteroid impact, right? Um, like the one that killed off the dinosaurs. Could have been a comet, could have been an asteroid, could have been a meteor, right? Uh, but, but something pretty big crashed, crashed into the Earth and, and created a dust cloud and probably killed off the dinosaurs. Um, lots and lots of uh, um, volcanic eruptions that went on for you know a million years or something like that and spewed all kinds of ash and soot into the atmosphere that blocked out the sun and, and caused the rise of greenhouse gases and things like that. Um, gamma ray bursts from um, stars that, that we don't even pay attention to that uh, explode and send gamma ray bursts our way and, and destroy everything. Um, and plants. Plants caused a mass extinction too. Uh, their plants were like, hey, guess what? We love to do photosynthesis. And photosynthesis removed so much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and created so much oxygen in the atmosphere that it caused the Earth's temperature to, to just plummet. And the entire Earth turned into a big old snowball, right? A big old ice ball. Uh, that was just plants doing their thing. Okay, so lots of different things can cause mass extinctions. Um, but the important thing to understand about mass extinction is and why uh, they lead to punctuated equilibrium is that when things die, the thing that they used to do within their ecosystem, their ecological niche, is now unfilled, right? So it's really easy for other organisms to go in and fill those niches, right? So mass extinctions. open ecological niches. Okay, so I want to focus um, your attention on just one of these mass extinctions. Let's talk about uh, the KT event or the KT extinction. That was the one around 65 million years ago or so that killed off all the non-avian dinosaurs, right? Uh, not all of them, but a lot of them, right? Uh, over 50% of them for sure. Um, and uh, this was the end of the age of the dinosaurs and it was the dawn of the age of the mammals, right? And the question that I have for you is, where were all the mammals in dinosaur time? Yeah, they were like little burrowing, little, yeah, shrews or rats, right? And um, why were they only those shrews and rats? What, like, why couldn't they just go out and live on the land and, and, and swim in the water, like, and be free? Yeah, because the dinosaurs would eat them, right? Because that's because those were the niches of the dinosaurs, right? They couldn't, they couldn't out-compete the dinosaurs because the dinosaurs had all these selective pressures on them that made them perfect for these different ecological niches, okay? So now, there's this uh, massive temperature swing on the Earth and the dinosaurs are cold-blooded, so they die, right? They, they, they can't survive. Uh, and now you've got all these, all these little tiny rodents, right? And these little tiny rodents, they go and maybe they eat the corpses of the dinosaurs and so they're able to have all this food and they reproduce and stuff. And the corpses of the dinosaurs are gone. And now there's so many rodents that they have to like compete with each other, right? There's intra-specific competition in there. And let's say that the best, uh, they're best at like running around on the forest floor and eating insects or something like that, okay? So some of those organisms, some of those rats are gonna be less good at um, running around and eating insects on the ocean, or not on the ocean floor, on the uh, forest floor, right? And so those ones are going to be outcompeted and they're going to die, or they have another option. The other option is adaptive radiation, right? So when they're adaptively radiating, they're going to go and try to find other ways to get food. Let's say one of those um, little rats sort of ventures into the water. It's like swimming around in the water in its little rat way. Rats are actually decent swimmers, but it's swimming around in the water and it's going to like catch some minnows right and that's that's it's gonna it's gonna be its new niche right the question that i have is this does it have to be good at catching minnows it just, has to be better than else. just has to be better than everyone else perfect and who's everyone else no one because no they're all dead right they all died in a mass extinction so there's nobody hunting minnows right now so all this rat has to be able to do is catch enough minnows to not die that's a pretty low bar, right? 
So that first generation of rats, all it has to do is catch enough minnows to not die, and there's going to be a lot of minnows because there's nothing eating them because all of the things that ate the minnows, all of the, the dinosaurs that used to eat the minnows are dead, right? So then the next generation, right, there might be more of the rats and then more and more and more and more to the point where now they're competing with one another. And so the minnows are becoming more and more scarce. And so there's a different selective pressure on those rats, right? The ones that are more streamlined or the ones that have, you know, greater amounts of webbing in their feet and can swim better, or the ones that have greater lung capacity, whatever. I don't know what makes rats good at eating minnows, but some different selective pressures are going to cause those rats to look dramatically different over a number of generations than um, the ones that are, that are eating insects on the forest floor, right? Does that make sense? Imagine there was no mass extinction. And those rats are like, okay, I, I, I can't get enough food on the forest floor here, so I'm just going to go try to get into the water and, and get some minnows, right, without the mass extinction. They need to go in and immediately be better at catching minnows than the things that are already occupying that niche that have had selective pressures on them for a very long time. Do you think that's likely? No, it's extremely unlikely, so it's not going to happen. So what stops gradualism from happening? Gradualism doesn't happen because everything is already in its niche. Everything is, is already doing the thing that it's best at. It might, yeah, get a little bit better at it, but for the most part, things get into a niche and they get good at doing that one thing, right? And then they keep doing it until they die for whatever reason, right? Because of like a mass extinction event. And then something else jumps into there. And that thing that jumps into there is probably not going to be super good at filling that niche at first. And then it's going to rapidly evolve into something that is better at filling that niche, right? Which from a fossil record standpoint looks like long periods of no change followed by short periods of rapid change. Make sense? All right. So, okay. So, um, I feel like every time I teach you about genetics or something like that, I can't tell you the whole story yet, right? Because you got to like learn one thing before you can learn other things, right? And so now is the thing that like we're 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 getting there. I've taught you about taught you about genes, and then we learned about like epigenetics that like some genes get turned on and off, right? And now we have this other third thing: these developmental genes. Specifically, we're going to focus on a type that are called Hox genes. Okay, Hox genes are, uh, like I said, developmental genes. And basically what they are, they're body plan genes, right? These are the ones that say how to make your body. They say put an eye here, put fingers here. Uh, you know, uh, you want to have five fingers per hand and you want to put the stubby one at the end, right? Uh, you also want to connect it to an arm. It's just telling you basically how to put you together, right? It doesn't know how to make an actual finger. It's just saying like, those things that you call fingers, put five of them on there, right? So we're going to call them body plan genes. And basically what they do is they say, uh, okay, uh, put these parts together, make this many of them, and put them together in this order, okay? So these tell how many of each body part to make. and where to put them. Right? So it seems like it seems like it would take a lot for somebody to be born with like four arms or something like that, right? So like uh, okay, like if based on this gradualistic mutations building up, right? In order to get four arms, you would have to get like a duplication of one part, and it would have to make twice as much of the uh, enzyme that tells you to make arms or anything like that. But that's not how it works, right? The way that you get four arms is your Hox gene just has a little blip in it that says like where it used to say make two, now it says make four, right? And that's weird because that's way more rapid or the changes would be way more rapid than we would ever expect, okay? Um, Hox genes are really great at um, changing body plans rapidly. So when you look at like arthropods and stuff, right, like insects, uh, insects are characterized by having like uh, different amounts of legs, right? So you could have like um, an arachnid, right, that has eight legs versus uh, an insect that has six legs, 
versus a myriapod uh, that have, like those are like uh, centipedes and millipedes that have lots and lots of legs, right? So how do they get so many more legs? Well, um, it says like put a head here, put an abdomen here, and then there's all these thorax segments, and the thorax segments just have legs on them, and so they're like put a head, then a thorax, then an abdomen. And what do you have in that case? You have an insect, right? Because like each one has a set of legs. But what if it says, put a head, put a thorax, put a thorax, and then put an abdomen? Well, then you've got an arachnid, right? What if it says like, put a head, put a thorax, and just keep putting thoraxes for a while, and then put an abdomen? Well, then you've got, then you've got a millipede, right? And so these changes in the Hawks genes are, are not telling you how to make a thorax, Right? They're just telling you how many thoraxes you should have and where they should go. Right? It's theoretically possible for uh, a Hawks gene to say like, hey, when you're making a hand, you want to put like five fingers on it and then like attach it to the head. Right? Now, that wouldn't be effective because like, then you wouldn't have the muscles to move your hand, but it could theoretically happen. Uh, something that does happen all the time is uh, a Hawks gene mutation that says like, hey, when you make a hand, put six fingers on it. Right? Polydactylism. And so sometimes you get two thumbs, sometimes you get two pinkies, right? Uh, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, right? And, uh, and those are just mutations in the Hox genes. And it doesn't take, you know, that much. It could be a single nucleotide polymorphism, one nucleotide shift. And that causes you to get a whole extra finger. Think about how many, how complex it is to make a finger, right? Lots and lots and lots and lots of genes are involved in the making of a single finger, right? You've got like all the epithelial, you've got the muscles, the bones, and all that stuff, right? And just a single nucleotide polymorphism can give you an extra one because of Hox genes, right? And this is another way that punctuated equilibrium makes a lot of sense is because one small mutation can lead to a large shift 